Boy, what a great word and what, how great it is to hear you sing, How Great Is Our God. First of all, I know we have a lot of guests here today because the boys and girls were singing. And yet I know what we have to do today. I want to say again, welcome to our guest. And uh, I'm going to just tell you the message today centers on something we have to do today. But if you'll hang on toward the end, Bill. A word for everybody. I know that I'm doing something, but I don't know what it is. Today, we're going to do something that we don't do very often as a church body. At the end of this service, we're going to nominate a man to be a deacon. It's been several years since we've been called to do this. We don't do it very uh, regularly. As I was thinking about it, it occurred to me and I felt inspired that today we probably need to be reminded about a couple of things about deacons. You can turn to Acts 6 that you see on the screen. I want to say this to you at the outset. Selecting a deacon, nominating a deacon is serious business because being a deacon is serious business. It's not a popularity contest. It's something that the deacons have said to me multiple times as we've approached this day. Being a deacon is not a running the church proposition. It's not a job that you run for like you run for political office. In fact, if there's anybody here today and you think that there is a man in this church who is running for deacon, you might order to run from him. The word deacon in the Greek, now I'm going to take just a, a personal privilege just to help us understand all the parts of this thing. They're going to put me one word up here, diakonos. Now we're going to leave that word there for a while. Diakonos. We can look in the deacon, we can look in the Bible, and that's generally uh, translated deacon. But here's what I want you to know. If you look at that word, you see how it ends in O-S? The Greek language is a lot like other languages. Let me just give you one for instance. It's like the Spanish language. You can change a word by its suffix. For instance, in Spanish, Antonio is male. Antonia is female. So you change the gender by the suffix. In the Greek language, y'all give me another space bar, guys. You have three words here. Diakonos, diakonia, and diakonia. Okay? May not have pronounced them like the Greeks would pronounce them, but that's pretty close. What do those things mean? Well, the first one means servant. That's the guy who is doing it. That's the deacon. The second one means, if you see that change, serving. That's the action that they take. And the third one is service. That's the ministry that they perform. And I only point this out to you so that you and I can see the root word. Can everybody say the root word that you see up there? Serve. Would you say that with me again? Serve. One more time. I, I want you to get it. Serve. That is exactly what the deacon is all about. In fact, the chairman of the deacons is the chief of the servants. He's the chairman of the servants. I bring this to your attention because I think you, we should know this. Be reminded of this. We know it. You cannot elect someone to be a servant of the church. Oh, you can give somebody the title of deacon, but you can't elect them to be the servant of the church. They either are or they are not. The best thing we can do is we can pray, we can observe, we can identify a man who is a servant of the church and then ask him to serve in the capacity of a deacon. Identifying those who serve and asking them to serve. Hit that one more time for me, guys. So we go, that makes our deacons the secret to fulfilling God's ministry here. The secret to filling God's, fulfilling God's ministry 
are indeed the deacons. If we're ever going to be everything God wants us to be, everything the Lord Jesus died for us to be, it will be because we have godly men, and I believe we do, serving as deacons. Now today, in that Acts 6 passage, we're going to read the story of those we believe to be the forerunners of the deacons. I will tell you going forward that the word deacon does not appear in this passage, but everybody, all the theologians and the Bible people that, that I know anything about believe that this is the forerunners of the deacon. The church was having a struggle. They needed some help. They needed some folks to, to help them move forward. And so they elected seven men, and the church selected them. The pastor assigned them the task. And then the young church in Jerusalem saw its best days and, its, and fulfilled God's ministry. If you have found Acts 6, would you stand with me as we read about this? <clears throat> Follow along, because this is indeed God's word. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve, that would be the elders, the pastors, the twelve summons the whole company of the disciples and said, it would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So, the word of God spread the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, that would be multiplied, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that as your church, that we will always do what you call us to do and want us to do. I pray that you would speak words to us today that would lead us to be the people that you want us to be, to select the man that you want us to select and give our lives to you the way you would like us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As I read this, I'll just tell you, as I, as I read this a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago, I was getting ready for this. The truth is, I was writing in the margin of my Bible what I was reading, and I had eight stops along this way, so don't anybody panic. It's not going to be extended. We're not going to be here until 2 or 3 o'clock. Eight stops along the way. But there's a lot of things that jump, jumped out at me as I read this. It occurred to me that Dr. Henry Cloud, Dr. John Townsend, and then the speaker Tony Robbins made this statement. We change our behavior when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. That's where the church in Jerusalem found itself. Things in this church had been working well until it wasn't. They thought everything was going along just fine, and then it wasn't. How often do we see this in life? We see it in business. I've mentioned in a previous message a number of months ago, back in the 80s and the 90s, Netflix, I mean, excuse me, Blockbuster Video thought they had everything they needed. There was a store in every town. They were renting videos left and right. 
Netflix came along and said, how about we stream it? They said, oh, we don't. What we need you for? And today, there's one blockbuster store, and there's millions of TVs with Netflix on it. No vision for the future, no awareness of where they were. Churches, that happens to churches. They get to thinking, everything is fine now, so why should we change anything? And that famous theologian, philosopher Mark Croner said to me one time, is that past success does not guarantee future success. You may have to change some. When I did training to be a director of missions, I was told, first thing I was told in my first training sessions is that Baptist associations run about 20 years behind everybody else. And, and from my being a DOM, that's pretty much true. The, the sin is looking backward and not forward. You see, the truth is, when we get to the church at Jerusalem, they thought what they had done in past would always serve them. And so I want to just walk down with you. I want to just kind of outline this story in a way you can kind of put some handles on it. I'm going to give you eight quick thoughts. The first one that came to my mind as I read this two weeks ago was the crisis. The crisis. I already said things were going good until it wasn't. We can find the crisis in verse 1. It says, in those days, as the number of disciples were increasing, so the church wasn't dying, there arose a complaint. That's what mine says. Some say murmur. Some say grumbling. Some say there were some hard feelings. For the first time in this church, there was trouble in the camp. We overlook the obvious about this. But how does that speak to us? This was a racial and a cultural issue. The Hebrew widows were being taken care of. Those other folks, the Hellenist widows, were not being taken care of. Now, the stronger translations use the word overlooked or neglected. But if you get to some of the more modern translations, they will say that it was discrimination. They were being discriminated against. The crisis could have been intentional. Certainly there was racial and cultural uh, back and forth in those days. It could have been unintentional. For crying out loud, they were growing so quick. Theologians tell us that probably at this point there were fifteen to 20,000 members of the Jerusalem church. It could have been intentional or unintentional, but neither, none of that matters because there was a serious problem in the church and it has to be dealt with. And the elders, the pastors, the twelve were the ones to, to deal with it. Anytime a church goes through difficulty or problems or change, it hurts the heart of the leaders and the pastors to see disunity come to the family of God. The truth is, is that things were going good in this church. This problem was not about the church not doing well. If you look back in chapter 5, you'll see that they were doing so well that they were performing signs and wonders, miraculous supernatural signs and wonders. They were doing so much in the community that they got arrested for their faith. Hello. They got arrested for what they were doing. And when they got released, they said, you are not to speak the name Jesus anymore, to which they responded, we must obey men rather than God. That's the message today. It's in this type of environment where God is working, he's moving, he's changing lives, that a crisis, a dilemma, a problem came. Now, when I read here, there's no indication, follow this, there's no indication that the people brought the dilemma to the preachers. There's no indication whether you like this or not, when there is a problem in the fellowship, and we don't have one that I know of, when there's a problem in the fellowship, it works its way to the leadership. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it gets there. But here's what the leaders knew, the elders, the twelve. They knew that this problem had to be dealt with. They knew. And so I want to suggest to you, it's not written here, 
that the, lead, that the leaders, that the twelve, heard about the problem, and they came together as elders of the church. As elders of the church. Elders are different than deacons. Elders are the leaders. And they prayed. They sought God. They sought counsel from one another. And then they feel like they heard from God. And they had a resolution. That brings them to what I'm going to tell you is the call. They called everybody together. My translation says they summons everybody together. Others will say they called them or they gathered them or they convened them. The Greek language that, in, in the Greek language, that word there is a strong word. It's a word like Jesus used when he called people to missions and to salvation and to ministry. It's authoritative. He, brought, he called them together like, it's almost like required attendance. Got them together. You see, the, the, the elders saw this. You think this is not a big deal. The elders saw this as a life and death issue. The Hebrew widows were getting food. And whether you, they didn't have social security back then. If, when, the, when, a, when a lady became a widow, and particularly in old age, a lot of them would starve. They were dependent on other people. And now in the body of Christ, they were meeting those needs. And the elders saw this as a life and death issue because these widows were not getting what they needed. It was an emotional time. Listen, we'll appreciate this. Tongues were wagging. Relationships were on edge. So the pastors knew this was important and it was vital and it couldn't have been just cast off. So they called everybody to be present to the meeting and they literally required attendance because they knew it wouldn't be taken care of unless everybody was there. And so how did they start the meeting? The third thing that I will just impress on you is their commitment. The commitment. It's their commitment. The twelve prayed it through and they quickly let, them, let the church know what their commitment was. It says, they said it would not be right for us to leave and to give up preaching the word and wait on tables. They acknowledged that there was a problem. They acknowledged it was a serious problem. That's why they called the meeting. They didn't do that that often. They were committed to spiritual leadership. They were committed to taking care of this problem. But they knew that they couldn't lead this body without God's help. And now it was time for a new type of of minister. And so their plan was, you guys, we're going to do what the Lord's commissioned us to do. You guys select from yourselves seven men who are ready spiritually and personally and practically to take care of this. And we will appoint them to this task. We will appoint them to this ministry we will allow them to perform this service. The twelve were committed to the spiritual health of the church, the spiritual vigor of the church, and they knew that they needed some help. And their answer was seven men whom today we affectionately call deacons. Fourth thing that I say to you as I read this is what I'm calling the consensus. I know this is a serious subject, but I'm just going to tell you, I've had more fun, Brent, with this over my lifetime as I've preached it than, than any other part of this. The consensus. Because they laid the plan out <laughs> and look down in verse uh, uh, 5. It says, this plan pleased the whole company. So in my mind, I'm going, they were not a Baptist church. I mean, Baptists are good and great, but I'm going to tell you, you know, let me tell you what you already know. You get four Baptists in one room and you got seven opinions about any topic. But it said that that pleased everybody. They were pleased to know that the twelve were taking this seriously, that they were taking this prayerfully, that they were taking this thoughtfully, and they were going to bring a solution to the problem. And watch this. Healing... To this fellowship. There's no, there's no indication that there was a vote of any kind. Uh, 
let me kill, let me throw a water on some of you. There was no Robert's Rules of Water back then. All it said is that he, this is 15,000 people they presented it to them. And they go, ah, that sounds, that's a plan. So then, as I read this on, this is kind of how it jumped out at me. They all agreed, and so then you get to the choosing. The choosing. Verse 3 says, Brothers and sisters, select from among you. Brothers and sisters, select from among you. Now, depending on your version, there's a whole lot, litany of words that are used here. Select, find, choose, pick out, seek out, carefully select. Look among you. Look, at, look ye out. Appoint. Look for. And then the message says, look around and pick out men to serve. They weren't looking for men who wanted a job. They weren't looking for men who could possibly do a job. They weren't looking for men who wanted a job. They weren't even looking for good businessmen. They were looking for specific men who could handle the money and the resources to make sure this ministry got into the places that it needed to be. The idea is choose, carefully select, seek out. Well, that's good, Brother Jerry. So what are the criteria? Well, we're going to characteristics. What would the characteristics of these men be? Now, for those who think that I'm about to run a mock, let me just remind you that at this point in history... Paul the Apostle was still Saul of Tarsus. Timothy had not been saved yet. So they didn't have those requirements that are over in 1 Timothy 3. They gave him, here's what I want you to do. I want you to choose out seven men. They must have a good reputation both inside and outside the church. Both inside and outside the church. Number two, they must be full of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what that speaks to. They must be saved. There must be no doubt that they're saved. They must be walking with God. They must have the attitude of the Lord. They must have put on Christ and put off all those other things that were told in the New Testament. That put on Him and walk in Him and imitate God. A good reputation, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. I remind you that Proverbs says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. They were looking for specific men. Specific men who were walking with God. That should be our task today. That should be our idea today. And I'll just tell you, even doing your best, you're not going to get it all right. These guys, they selected seven men. Well, they must have all been good. Well, obviously they were, but do you realize that out of the seven men, that one of them went off the rail? Not too long ago. In fact, we'll get back to our Revelation study. But you'll remember in Revelation 2 where, they, where, where the warning was about the Nicolaitans. Look at the name of the seventh uh, disciple named here. His name was Nicholas. History and tradition tells us that Nicholas became one that started a sect all his own. He held to the doctrine, doctrine of Balaam, Balaam from the Old Testament. Some people suggest that he was immoral. Certainly others suggest that this, this sect had an air of superiority. That's one of the reasons that you don't, we don't identify people and give them the office of the deacon if they're a novice. Paul would tell us that later. It's because they would develop this air of superiority. The men should be selected based on their walk with God. A few moments. We're going to pass out, our men will pass out some ballots. Because we're going to nominate one man to serve in this spiritual capacity of the deacons. He should be a man in our community of a good reputation in the church, outside the church. Full of two things. Full of wisdom. Somebody that you'd go to 
for counsel and advice, full of the Holy Spirit. Someone you know was walking with the Lord. Back to our story, when they selected the seven, the, the seventh thing I saw here was their consecration. Because what they did, they brought them out. Look down here in verse 6. They had them stand before the apostles, the elders, who prayed and laid hands on them. That verse gives us a great picture of that thing we call ordination. I'm saying consecration because what we do is we identify and we set aside for serving the church, for caring for widows, for taking the weight of the ministry off the leaders, for returning the fellowship to unity and harmony. They set the, these, these before the twelve who placed, I want you to hear this, they placed their hand on them. The laying on of a hand is a very biblical picture. You can walk it back to the Old Testament. It's, you, you can find it in Exodus. You can find it in Leviticus. You can find it in Numbers. You can find it in Chronicles. Let me just give you a couple of illustrations. In Numbers, Aaron's priest, the, the priests who were of Aaron's line, they were consecrated by the laying on of hands. In Acts chapter 13, Paul, he was Saul at that time, and Silas and, and Barnabas were consecrated, set apart by the laying on of hands. Paul reminds Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, you know, Timothy, remember what was given to you by the laying on of hands. The original laying on the hands in the Old Testament had to do with sacrifice. It went something like this. You bring an animal, you give him to the priest, and they says, that animal lays there before he's sacrificed. You put your hand on him as if to say, God, he's yours. God, I give him to you. If we, elect, if we select someone who has to be ordained, it will be very common practice for us to walk through an ordination service where we lay hands on them. If we elect someone who's already been ordained, we may, we may decide to have an installation service where once again we put our hands on them and set them apart as if to say, God, he's yours. I want you to be reminded that in Numbers, that Moses put his hand on Joshua at the instruction of God so that the people would respect and love Joshua the same way that they did Moses. In the Jerusalem church, they put their hand on them as a blessing, as a sign of blessing and offering, and harmony and unity were restored. Which brings us to the last thing, what I'm calling the consequence. Now, most of us think of a consequence, we think of that old show, truth or consequences, or a consequence of something bad, but really, a consequence is the outcome. A consequence is the result of what you've done. Look at verse 7 with me. If you still got your Bibles open, look there. So, the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. When the deacons were selected, ordained, given the responsibility, fulfilled the responsibility, the church flourished. So I want to just look at that as I end. The Word of God spread. I remind you of what you know so well. Jesus died on a cross for both every sin and every sinner. He died to give life to us. He died to make us his disciples, his followers. He died to, to literally exchange our old heart for the new heart that he has for us. That happens when we place our faith in him. The Word of God says that Jesus came 
to redeem. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came for you. And when we get this right, the word of God has spread. The second thing we see there, not only did the word of God spread, but the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly, multiplied in number. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. So go and make disciples. We are only disciples when we start making disciples. If nobody's ever talked to you about that, let me encourage you about something. We're starting a, a men. Let me talk to the men. Men, next week's Father's Day. I hope you'll be here. Two weeks from today, we're starting a men's Bible study that is pointed toward discipleship. What time does it start, Sherman? 5.30? 5.30 on the last Sunday of this month. You see, when we get it right, a large number of people become disciples. Why? Because the last line, a large group of priests became obedient. People and priests become obedient to the faith. Folks, the nomination that we make today is important. It's important. But here's what I will tell you. The nominator needs to have a pure heart. If, if you have not trusted Christ Jesus, now is the time. If you've not received him as your personal savior, now is the time. The nomination is important, the nominator is important, and the nominee is vital. Jesus died for our salvation. He put in place these things so for our growth and our maturity. And if we're going to be his church, his people, we need to make decisions that honor him. What decision is he calling you to today? Let's pray together.